Welcome to the Japan Society's regular webinar on current affairs and business. I am Bill Emmett, and as you, many of you know, I have the honor and pleasure of chairing the Japan Society. This week, our topic is something firmly in the news. No, it is not the proposed soccer super league, but rather something far more fundamental to our country's interests, US-Japan relations in the light of the summit meeting in Washington DC last Friday between President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga. All of us know that for the past seven decades, the relationship with the United States has been central to Japan's defense, security and diplomacy and of vital importance to its economy and to much else besides. We also know that while the US has many important relationships as befits a global power, Japan is clearly its most important in the Pacific. So it wasn't a surprise when Shinzo Abe became the first foreign leader to meet President-elect Trump in 2016, albeit unconventionally during the transition. And it isn't a surprise that Prime Minister Suga has now been the first foreign leader to hold an in-person summit with President Biden since his January inauguration. But there's been a lot going on besides simply the ritual of meetings between leaders. Some of it has to do with a new US administration, but most has to do with the issue common also to us in the UK of how to relate to China, over economics and trade, over the pandemic, over technology, human rights, climate, and above all defense and security in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So it was that in March, the four-way Indo-Pacific grouping known as the Quad the US, Japan, India, and Australia stepped up a gear by announcing a major collaboration over vaccine production and supply in Southeast Asia to balance Chinese vaccine diplomacy. And now at the Suga Biden summit one month later, we've seen US, Japan collab collaboration also step up a gear with a major announcement about telecoms and other technological joint development and a joint statement about peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, the first such joint statement on Taiwan by the US and Japan since 1969, when Richard Nixon and Isaku Sato met in a similar forum. So what is going on? Where is this heading and how might it affect the rest of the world? To address those questions, I'm delighted to welcome two very expert and experienced diplomats from the US and Japan. In Tokyo, I welcome Kunihiko Miyake, who is currently research director at the Canon Institute for Global Studies, following a distinguished career in diplomacy and as an advisor to recent governments. Miyake-san has been director of the US-Japan Security Treaty Division at the Gaima Show, as well as serving in the embassies in Beijing and Baghdad. And in Washington, DC, I welcome Ambassador Jim Zumwalt, who as an American diplomat also served in Beijing at the same time as Kuni Miyake. Ambassador Zumwalt most recently served as Deputy Chief of Mission at the US Embassy in Tokyo at the time of the 311 disaster and has been responsible for policy in the State Department towards Japan and Korea. Now, Ambassador Zumwalt is Chairman of the Japan America Society of Washington DC, which I think I can fairly describe as a kind of cousin, American cousin, to our own Japan Society. I'm going to ask our speakers to give us brief opening remarks, followed by discussion and, crucially, your questions. Please, as usual, submit your questions using the Q&A function, and feel free to vote for other people's questions so as, so as to bring them faster to my attention. Since the summit took place in Washington, I will start with Jim Zumwalt. Jim, welcome to the Japan Society of the UK, and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Bill, and thanks to our cousin, the Japan Society. It's wonderful to visit relatives, and I hope we can do this uh, more often. Um, yeah, let me just briefly comment a little bit on the state of US-Japan relations. Um, Bill gave actually a very excellent summary, but you know, in addition to um, Prime Minister Suga being the first foreign leader to visit Washington in the Biden administration, there actually was an entire month of remarkable uh, events. Uh, you, uh, Bill mentioned the March 12 uh, virtual quad meeting between the leaders of Japan, the US, uh, India, and Australia. Uh, on March 16, Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin 
made their first foreign trip to uh, Japan, where they hosted, uh, where they uh, participated in a two plus two meeting of foreign and defense ministers. Um, and then on April 2nd, the uh, National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, hosted his Japanese and Korean counterparts to a meeting at the Annapolis uh, Naval Academy uh, for a discussion of US-Japan-Korea relations. So the uh, engagement of the president and the prime minister was the fourth you know, high level meeting uh, in less than a month. And I think it shows one of the big differences with the Trump administration. This summit had a lot of preparation and careful coordination uh, in advance. It wasn't something that was done off the cuff. And I think that is uh, probably the biggest difference if you compare that to the uh, meetings President Trump had with, uh, with uh, Prime Minister Abe. Um, but let me just now briefly mention, you know, the reason Japan is so important to the United States is Japan really is our key security ally. Uh, Japan hosts more American service members than any other country. There are 52,000 service members stationed in Japan. Uh, Japan is the only uh, ally which hosts a American carrier battle group, the uh, USS Ronald Reagan and its accompanying ships are all based in Japan. Uh, about one third of our Marine Corps combat power, the three a third Marine Expeditionary Force is based in Japan and ready for action in the uh, Pacific. Um, and also our commitments to the Republic of Korea to defend Korea from attack would simply not be possible without the logistical support from the UN rear bases in Japan, which provide uh, support uh, for uh, potential dealing with a potential conflict on the Korean Peninsula. So without Japan, we would not be an Asia Pacific power. I think that's as simple as that. Um, I think the, uh, but there are also several other reasons why our relationship is so important. And I think from the Biden administration perspective, there are two other major differences uh, with uh, his predecessor. Um, the first is um, even greater concerns about the threats from both uh, China and Russia, which mean that the Biden administration wants to work closely with friends and allies and uh, partners. Uh, in dealing with these threats. And so we, there's a much greater value to our alliance relationship, uh, not only with Japan, but with our other allies. And secondly, a greater concern about global issues, climate change, pandemic diseases, um, those sorts of things. And, and for that reason, again, a desire to work closely with partners because these are not problems that can be solved by the United States alone. So I think the Biden administration sees Japan as a critical partner in dealing with issues like uh, climate change. And then finally, I'll just mention that um, from an economic perspective, it, it, interestingly, this is the first summit, I think, between the Uni uh, United States and, uh, and Japanese leader in a long time where trade was not featured as one of the prime uh, areas of, of uh, and that's mainly because our, our relationship is very positive right now. Japan uh, last year replaced the United Kingdom as the largest foreign investor in the United States. And this uh, Japanese foreign investment has really strengthened our uh, auto industry, uh, but many other industries. And a lot of uh, Japanese uh, investors are bringing Japanese technology to the United States and helping us build a much stronger economy. So, and I think there's a much greater recognition of the benefits of our bilateral relationship, a bilateral economic relationship uh, with Japan. But lastly, I'll just mention before uh, turning things back over, um, you know, our alliance, the alliance between the United States and Japan is the longest bilateral alliance uh, that has existed in the world since the Treaty of Westphalia. It's been now over 60 years. Uh, and the reason for that, that that has endured for so long is because we share common values. We're both democracies. We believe in rule of law. We believe in human rights. And so our alliance is not only based on shared interests, but also on shared values. Um, lastly, before I turn things over, I wanna briefly mention um, American expectations and hopes for what role the United Kingdom can play in the Indo-Pacific region, because we see our friends and partners in Europe as key uh, participants in that as well. Um, I, I think we would like to see a greater role on the part of the UK as a balancing power in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we want Europeans to uh, exercise their soft power, uh, support for values, norms, and principles. Uh, and we also would like to see our partners in Europe, including the United Kingdom, working 
closely with us in multilateral organizations where we share concerns. Sometimes this means it'll be in collaboration with China on issues like climate change, but sometimes it means uh, where we might be in a more uh, confrontational mode on issues like uh, human rights. So we very much uh, welcome uh, active participation of the United Kingdom in the uh, Indo-Pacific region and want to partner uh, with our friends across the Atlantic as we look at our, uh, our situation in the Pacific. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you uh, very much, Jim. And um, we will no doubt follow up on some of the specific issues that were raised in the summit. Um, as you say, it's for anyone who's been uh, looking at the US and Japan over many years, as I uh, can confess that I have, the absence of trade from that uh, issue is quite a, quite a striking one. And that's a very, very important point. Now, Kuni Miyake, how, yes. do, things, how do things look from Tokyo? Well, I don't have much to add to what uh, Jim has said. So um, I, I just want to give you my personal uh, observation. Although I'm advising the prime minister, but uh, I just tried to stay away from that for a while. When I give you my uh, perspective uh, of uh, the uh, strategic, I would say, transformation in this part of the world. I mean, uh, in the Pacific region. First of all, I, I, uh, it, it's, it's about the uh, Japan-US summit, but I like to say first, time has changed. Things have changed completely. Two days before Prime Minister Suga visited Washington, he announced, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Biden, President Biden announced that he would withdraw the, the US troops from Afghanistan by September 11. Then two days later, he uh, issued a joint statement with Prime Minister Suga. What does it mean? It is a shift of or the prior, or priority of the US foreign policy from the Middle East to East Asia, period. We've been, I've, I've been advocating this for four years. And finally, the American seems to understand that. Uh, that's my impression. I may be wrong. Um, and somebody, uh, and Jim also said that um, unlike the uh, uh, Trump era, yes, Mr. Abe met Mr. Trump uh, before he, he was inaugurated, but it was a, a, a sort of a very personal and, 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 and not even tactical, but I think the the visit of Mr. Suga to Washington to meet with the president of the United States is this time is extremely strategic. Uh, and that is my uh, observation. So what is the uh, objectives? What are the objectives of Mr. Suga's visit to Washington this time? Um, I'm not advised, I, I, this is my personal thought. Number one, to reconfirm uh, the importance, significance of the Japan US Security Alliance to the world. Number two, we do that without provoking China, and uh, without provoking China not to overreact to the, the, the agreement we reached, or I'll state it in the joint statement. And the third is, of course, all politics is local. So he's a politician, Mr. Suga is a politician. So he has to convince the audience in Japan and also Mr. Biden himself, that Mr. Suga is a person who can be trusted. So these three things are extremely important for all of us, uh, domestically and internationally. Then I think the uh, visit was very successful. And uh, I'm a little bit worried about the reaction from China, but I don't think it, uh, they will, I don't think they will overreact for, for the reasons probably I will let you know later. Then a uh, second thing I'd like to talk about is the transformation of the Japan-US security arrangement or alliance. You know, before 19, 1991, well, when, when the Cold War prevailed. It was uh, one of the uh, anti-communist uh, security alliance 
And at that time, uh, the, the treaty basically covered the, what we call the uh, uh, Far East, area of the Far East. And we, we our focus was mainly on, uh, on the Korean Peninsula and Taiwan. And I, it worked and nothing happened. That, that was uh, your success of the alliance. But then the Cold War ended in 1991 and the Gulf War started. So that means um, we started uh, drifting in a sense. What is the purpose of the Japan-US Security Treaty? What's the significance? We have to redefine it. It took us a decade or two because we've been wondering how to, how to define it, redefine it. Because China was not on the rise, the Soviet Union is gone, and the trade war was going on between Japan and the United States. So it was a tough time. I was a director at that time in the North America Bureau. So that's why I can, I can guarantee you that uh, it was a very tough time. And I, when I, I was a director in the North America Bureau in 1998, and I almost started telling the Americans and my colleagues inside the foreign ministry that um, China is on the rise. And, and they, they could be, a, they could be a, a, a challenge to us. But nobody believed me. Nobody believed me until recently. So finally, uh, since uh, I would say 20, well, I would say 15, 14, 15, in the second term of the uh, Obama administration, the Americans seems to realize, finally realize that something is wrong in East Asia and China is on the rise. The Americans and the Japanese alike, and maybe Europeans alike in the 1990s, that we, we were daydreaming at that time because we, they dreamt that we can engage China and we can make a Chinese economy a capitalist one so that they will get rich and prosper and then eventually they will have a civil society which will lead to a democratized China at the end. We were, we believed that and we invested in China enormously, but unfortunately we were wrong. Engaging and, and enriching China uh, didn't, didn't uh, lead to a, a new sort of a, um, a civil society in China. So we finally uh, realized that recently. So that's why that's the reason why the US foreign policy has shifted from the Middle East to, to East Asia. So I, um, um, in a sense, so since 1868, since we started the, uh, the process of modernization, it took us more than a hundred, more than a century. Uh, it took us, I mean, it took Japan and the United States more than a century to realize that our values are common for the first time, in my view. So um, what's gonna happen next? We will uh, be a status quo power in that part of the world. And we will uh, probably challenge the, uh, the uh, revisionist nations so that uh, we will secure the sea lines of communication and we, we uh, maintain the maritime stability on the ocean. So in that sense, I like to close. Um, there are two successful uh, maritime alliances Japan had. Uh, uh, in the past uh, 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 one and a half centuries, uh, since 1868. Number one is Anglo-Japanese alliance. And second is the US-Japan alliance. These are two maritime security arrangement between the islanders or, or maritime nations or sea powers, I would say. Um, we left, or you left us, and we switched to the Germans and Italians for a while. But since 1945, we came back 
to the another second island alliance, successful one. So I strongly urge my friends in uh, the United Kingdom, please come back to East Asia. Please come back to where you once belong and we'll be all right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miyaki-san, and uh, thank you to you both for uh, giving us a very strong sense of the relationship and, uh, and of where it's going. I um, do encourage our uh, attendees to uh, submit questions, plenty coming in, and I'm going to um, build on one, but, but sort of adapting it to my own thoughts as well. Joanna Pittman has asked, to what extent did Prime Minister Suga meet US expectations and hopes and regards, uh, hopes with regards the Japanese pushback against China, which is, um, to which I'll add the question really about Taiwan um, and related to it, the recent uh, sanctions exchange between uh, the US, EU, UK, uh, Canada and China over Xinjiang and Hong Kong, which Japan did not participate in. Um, so how do we interpret this balance of things? You've got Taiwan appearing in an official statement for the first time since 1969. Why was that important? But secondly, where does, do you think the US feels Japan is in regard to this um, common front vis-a-vis -vis China? Perhaps go back to you, Jim. How does that, how, how does that look? Why Taiwan? Why, where is Japan on this? Sure. Um... I'm not sure I would agree with the premise of the question that the US was the one pushing Japan to be tougher on China. I think you could make the opposite argument that many Japanese friends were quite concerned, particularly in the second half of the Obama administration, that the US was too soft on China, uh, acquiescing in Chinese moves in the South China Sea and quite a lot of unhappiness about the soft nature of our policy. So many Japanese welcomed when President Trump came to office that President Trump took a much more, uh, in some ways, confrontational stance uh, about uh, China's actions. So, um, I mean, I'm curious about Kuni's views, but I think mm -hmm. many Japanese, uh, in fact, welcome the, Ob and, and then when President Obama was elected, there was a huge concern in Japan that the United States would revert to a softer policy, uh, leaving Japan sort of um, alone, if you will, in the region to face a, uh, a China that seems more willing to take risks and more willing to try and shape the environment on Chinese terms. So if anything, I would say there's a meeting of the minds on the overall strategy that it's important for countries like the United States and Japan to work together to constrain uh, Chinese uh, attempts to shape the world order. Uh, there may be tactical differences. You mentioned the um, you know, different approaches on places like Xinjiang, but I think overall there's a, a convergence of US and Japanese views that it's important for us to work together. Now, this doesn't mean that we confront everywhere uh, in areas like, uh, dealing with the uh, coronavirus pandemic, we need to work with China. There's, we, there's no solution to this problem without all the major countries working together. But I am curious, Kuni, about your thoughts on, uh, did you feel that the United States was pressuring Japan to be tougher on China? Uh, there, there have been uh, various uh, uh, press reports about that. There are some speculations like that. But um, I think, um, uh, as I said at the beginning, this summit is much more strategic than any other uh, 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 summit meetings in the past. We think strategically and Americans do the same. Mr. Trump didn't, but we do and Mr. Biden does. So I, I think it, there's a, 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 a two common, a, a common strategic goals we share. Uh, in this uh, in the summit meeting, so in, with respect to Taiwan, uh, you uh, you right. We said that uh, yes, the the last time we referred to Taiwan was back in 1969. Uh, but uh, at that time, as I said, uh, it, it's a completely different uh, situation. We were focused on uh, 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 the Communist China versus the Republic of China, and then um, since then. Having said that, our policy in, within the context of the security treaty with the United States, the policy 
vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan has not changed since the 1960 treaty. Taiwan is, import, is an important element for the security and stability of Japan. That was a statement uh, in the 1969 joint statement. And also he, uh, Prime Minister Sato referred to that again in his speech in the National Press Club uh, 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 statement. So my, my point is that in 1972, uh, we stopped talking about it, although the, the policy has not changed. And since we saw a, a possibility of stabilizing, uh, or maintaining the status quo over the um, uh, Taiwan Strait, we stopped referring to that policy for some time. But recently, what we learned, especially since 2010 and 2012, when the Chinese vessels started uh, coming to the, Taiwan, uh, the Senkaku Islands, we realized that the status quo is being challenged for the first time since 1945. It's a real threat, potential, but a real potential threat to Japan for the first time since 1945. So that is a reason why um, the, the, our attitude vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis China in terms of sanctions, you say sanctions, what do you mean by sanctions? If you call it a sanction, any, any measure is sanction, yes, it is a sanction. If you don't call it a sanction, it's not a sanction, but it's also a measure to convince the Chinese side to change their policy. And we are much closer, geographically, much closer to China. And our views and the policies are not and shouldn't be identical to the ones the Americans or Europeans have. By the same token, European policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia or the Soviet Union is different because of the, for geographic reasons. So uh, I think it's still natural to have some differences uh, in the attitude uh, 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 to confront China and, and, and uh, also with respect to the measures to convince China or urge China to change their policy. But it's not uh, uh, a big ch uh, big difference. I believe that um, in a sense, we are part of, part of the uh, international community to strongly urge China to change its policy, whether you call it a sanction or not. Thank you. And um, Jim, just back to you briefly on this, on, on Taiwan. Where do you think the administration's thinking is going on Taiwan? Is this part of a deterrence approach towards China, um, or is it a sort of leveling up of, uh, uh, in terms of treatment of Taiwan? W where is it going? Because it, I mean, that is, as it were, the, the slightly new element, at least to an outside observer. No, I agree. I think there has been a, a growing concern about Chinese uh, aggressive actions toward Taiwan, some of their military exercises, for example. Um, I think one thing you will see uh, going forward is more uh, joint exercising with Japan in areas in the East China Sea, uh, partly related to Chinese aggressive actions on the Senkakus that uh, Kuni mentioned, but also, to be honest, this is a way of preparing perhaps for a situation involving Taiwan as well. So you're right that uh, there's a great deal of concern about Chinese aggressive actions toward Taiwan. Uh, to be fair, um, I think the United States also will be putting a lot of uh, pressure on Taiwan to increase its own defense capabilities. It's really up to Taiwan to defend itself. I mean, perhaps the US can play a helpful role and hopefully a, de a deterrent role, but the best deterrence is for the Chinese to be not certain that any attempt to invade would be successful. And so we are concerned about low levels of Taiwan defense spending and also on the type of spending. Um, they really need to focus on the type of defense spending that will really um, make it more difficult for an outside power to invade Taiwan. Well, and just briefly, uh, let me add something. The distance between the Taiwan Island and the Japanese Southern 
a territory called island called Yonagunijima. It's only 110 kilometers. Mm. The distance is only 110 kilometers. That means whatever happens to Taiwan, or with, especially if China really wants to liberate the island, it, it will engage the Japanese territorial waters and Japanese airspace. In addition to that, they, if they really want to liberate the island, they cannot do that without attacking the US forces in Okinawa and elsewhere. This is, a, this is the geographic sort of a reality. The distance is so short, we are too close to uh, Taiwan. No, thank you. That's a very important uh, reminder. Now, I mean, still looking in this defense and security area, Nicholas McLean has asked, do the speakers see the quad US, Japan, India, Australia, as expandable into the Quin, including South Korea, or are there still too many unresolved issues between Japan and the Republic of Korea, to which I might add from a UK point of view, the UK might think, well, maybe it should be expanded into either the Quin or the sextet, including the UK. Um, uh, how do you think about the future of this quad and can it be uh, wider? Jim, first. Sure. Um I think you know the Quad started as four countries providing assistance to Indonesia and Thailand after the tsunami. And then because most of the assistance was done through our navies, the realization that we should work together in order to coordinate our assistance. So that was the beginning, very much humanitarian response. Um, I think it's important not to see the Quad as a military alliance because it isn't. Mm -hmm. And as long as India is a partner, it won't be. You know, India is not interested in a formal military alliance. But what we have is four democracies who are concerned about maintaining an open, free uh, region, uh, willing to work together in many ways. So in one sense, it would make sense for a country like South Korea, which is also a democracy and also interested in promoting a free and open region to, to participate. However, um, the, one of the challenges is many people portray the Quad as an anti-Chinese uh, grouping. And as long as it's seen as an anti-Chinese grouping, Korea, I think will be reluctant to join. So my suggestion would be for the Quad, we really need to focus on what we're for rather than what we're against. Uh, and as long as we focus on the positive agenda of what we're for, things like uh, providing vaccines to the region to deal with the problem. Uh, as long as we focus on those things, perhaps we might then uh, entice uh, South Korea to participate as well. Uh, your last point about the UK, I personally would welcome, and I'm pretty confident the Biden administration would welcome greater UK engagement. And so if there were interest, uh, you know, it's not a formal organization. There's no secretariat, there's no membership dues, uh, but certainly there could be uh, quad activities where the UK were also to participate as a way of starting to form a five-way relationship. Thank you. Yes. No. I, 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 by, by way of perhaps uh, comment, I that that when respond listening to Cooney saying about uh, finally there's been a shift towards East Asia in U.S. policy. I'd say um, you know as an observer, I think the U.S. has often thought it should be shifting towards East Asia, but the Middle East has, and uh, and Central Asia have had a habit of distracting it back. Um, has been a lot of the problem. Whereas in the U.K.'s point of view, we have now to my regret, left the European Union and um, having more of an, in, an, an emphasis on East Asia, as it were, does, 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 does make uh, some sense. Um, now, other question, Hervé Couré, um, question to you, Mia uh, Kuni. Um, as US sanctions grow, Myanmar, Russia, Iran, and so do China's supports to Iran more recently, can you elaborate on the Beijing move to the forefront of conflicting US foreign policies, how to assess the strategic challenges facing uh, the US on this disunity. Next, what about North Korea? How does this fit in? So this is, he's really asking for a, a Japanese point of view on as it were, US strategic thinking. You know, uh, I've been uh, telling my audience that um, uh, it is, it won't be a choice between China and the United States for Japan, I mean. It is not a choice between economic China and uh, security United States. It's not the kind of choice. Our choice is whether or not we believe in 
universal values and uh, free and open in the Pacific. And also the, uh, the like joining the like-minded nations in the international community versus, versus the uh, challenger of the status quo. So the revisionist nations are uh, uh, not uh, our interest. We, 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 we are status quo power, as I said. Therefore, the sanction is, of course, one of, one of the uh, options, but there are various uh, means and measures to convince the, those revisionists to change their mind. So some, if necessary, we might, we might take sanctionary measures. We might, we also take uh, 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 dialogue, diplomacy, sometimes the security measures, trade measures. So all things combined. So it's not the uh, only uh, sanction per se. Um, with respect to North Korea, well, thanks to uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, predecessor uh, 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 to Mr. Biden, uh, I think he uh, screwed things up. The, uh, it's gone. I mean, I mean, the uh, we cannot get back. What after four years of uh, flip flop or whatever, whatever, whatever uh, TV show or or tweet games. Uh, what we have now is uh, North Korea with more weapons of mass destruction and with more sophisticated missiles. So it's not easy. Those four years will not come back. And we cannot get back to 19, uh, 2017. Uh, of course, we cannot get back to 1994. So um, we don't have... Uh, good uh, multiple options to 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 uh, uh, make the um, uh, nuclearization of uh, North Korea complete, but uh, well, I think uh, we have done that before, and uh, uh, we will continue to do the same. And unfortunately, China will uh, probably try to keep uh, North Korea as it is as a buffer state. So it will be a long game, long challenge, difficult challenge for us to take. Do you, I mean, actually Martin Hatful, um, my deputy chair, former British diplomat in Japan and former British ambassador in Indonesia, um, said, good to see you, Kuni, and asked, do you, Japan and the US now see eye to eye on North Korea? But also, and I'll ask Jim to answer that in a second, but he also asked, is there now any significant domestic Japanese political opposition to the continued and indeed now closer US-Japan alliance. How does this play in Japanese politics? Mm, I think the, uh, according to uh, the latest opinion polls, 60% uh, of the Japanese, uh, surveyed Japanese uh, supported uh, Mr. Suga's uh, visit to the United States this time. So I, even the um, opposition party members would not, they challenge the, the Mr. Suga's handling of the vaccines maybe, but as far as the US-Japan relations are concerned, I don't see much criticism, uh, serious ones yet, because they, they are really uh, 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 sick and tired of the Chinese behavior recently. So I don't think that uh, uh, the opposition party members can uh, seriously challenge the uh, Mr. Suga in terms of the, uh, his uh, uh, recent visit to Washington. Thank you. Um, Jim, do you have any thoughts, anything you want to add on North Korea, policy towards Korea? And then after that, I'm going to switch to a question on Africa that's come, which is also directed at you. Um, sure. Um, yeah, I think on North Korea, um, it's important if you look at the joint statement that Prime Minister Suga and President Biden issued, uh, the United States made two security commitments in that joint statement. And one was the commitment on the Senkakus, that we recognize that this these islands were administered by Japan and therefore they fall under the security treaty. In other words, the United States would, uh, would respond to any attack on those 
uh, territories. But the second commi uh, commitment the United States reiterated, and this is not new, is that the United States would respond, and I think the phrase was, with the full range of capability to an armed attack on Japan. And that was a statement directed to North Korea. If you attack Japan, you, ha you have the capability now to do so with your missiles, but the United States would respond and full range of capability is a euphemism for nuclear weapons. So it was reiterating our nuclear umbrella, if you will. Um, but I think the reason this was so important in this statement is um, because Kuni's right, North Korea is further along in its nuclear program, it's further along in its missile programs than it was four years ago. And so deterring and containing is something that's very important. And I think uh, that statement I'm sure was welcomed you know, by the Japanese. Um, the second uh, part where I think the United States and Japan agree uh, on North Korea is the, on the human rights issues. And in fact, if you notice, Kuni, maybe you can show it, you're wearing your blue pin on your lapel today, um, which is a symbol of not forgetting Japanese nationals that were abducted in the 1970s and 80s uh, into North to Korea. Keep and um, when President Biden met with Prime Minister Suga, he was wearing a blue pin, which was his statement that he uh, acknowledges this is a serious uh, human rights issue, that uh, citizens were abducted against their will and brought to North Korea and that North Korea must uh, take responsibility for this and account for what has happened uh, to these people. So it's a symbolic gesture, but I think nonetheless, it was something that was appreciated by the prime minister because this is a big a political issue in Japan and the United States was show, showing our solidarity and our support uh, for Japanese efforts to obtain a full accounting for this. Now, thank you. And so Yuichiro Nakajima has asked, um, directing particularly your experiences as, as, an, as an ambassador for the US in several African countries. Um, you have, Jim, you have firsthand experience of witnessing what China does in Africa in terms of economic aid, infrastructure, investment, et cetera. Have they gained a strong political str strategic foothold on the continent? Are Japan and the US doing enough to keep China's influence in check? How do you see that issue? Yeah, no, thank you. And, and thanks, Yuichiro. I'm very glad to see you. We're old friends from Tokyo as well. So it's good to see you uh, or, or engage with you on this program today. Uh, no, you're, you're, well, first of all, you know, Africa is a huge continent. And so it's hard to give a blanket statement about Chinese influence in Africa. Um, certainly in West Africa, where I served in Senegal and Guinea-Bissau, uh, China had a major presence. But my um, thought in West Africa was that uh, this uh, presence was not winning China a lot of friends. It, frankly, China was making the same mistakes uh, that the United States and other aid donors had made in the 1950s and 60s with some ham-handed and inappropriate assistance that really resulted in a lot of resentment against uh, China. So you saw a lot of uh, signs, um, you know, protesting uh, China's unwillingness to hire local labor for its projects, for example. So um, I don't think uh, I don't think we need to ignore or we should ignore China's presence in Africa. But I also think we should lead with uh, the positive areas of how we can be working together. Um, Africa needs uh, infrastructure investment, and on that score, I must say that uh, uh, former Prime Minister Abe, uh, it, when Ch Japan was a G20 chair, made some good proposals on how countries like the United States, Japan, and countries in Europe could work together to uh, promote quality infrastructure where you're looking at the uh, complete impact, including the environmental impact and the social impact of infrastructure investments and also the impact on debt. So I think there's work that the United States and Japan and Europe could do to promote these ideas of quality infrastructure because just saying no and telling people don't take Chinese money is not a very successful strategy. We need to present some alternatives. Absolutely, that's very interesting. I've always thought that money doesn't smell. It's only the qu question of whether you need the next lot of money that, that might smell. Um, and uh, so that, that's an interesting- There's a limit to uh, China's attempt in Africa and just bribing the leaders will not pay in the end. So they will know, the Africans will know, not all of them, but uh, hopefully. Yeah. No, exactly. Now to switch attention again, and um, we're ranging very nice and widely. James Hardy has asked, 
To what extent do both speakers think that the change in the US administration will force a change in Japan's Russia policy? To which one might add, how about the change in, in the, from the Abe to Suga administrations also on Russia policy? Kuni, how do you see Japan? Well, um, Mr. Abe's uh, uh, policy uh, in the end is to review all the uh, outstanding issues in the post-World War II Japan and, and try to solve it as much as he can. And one of the outstanding or unsolved, un unresolved issue was the Northern Territories and the uh, Japan-Russia uh, uh, relations. And he had tried very hard, uh, but uh, as I don't want to say this, but it's not, very successful, for, but for good reasons, in my view, because um, Mr. Putin was not ready to make a strategic judgment vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Japan and vis-a-vis -vis China. So I've been telling my audience these days that, you know, if China became, becomes a strategic threat to Russia, Russian Federation, that'll be a time, the time when we might see a, a diplomatic revolution in Russia, as it happened to China in 1972. But this was not going to happen. At that time, it happened to China because the Soviet Union war became the strategic threat to the People's Republic of China. But unfortunately, China is not, in the eyes of the uh, Mr. Putin, China is not yet the biggest strategic threat to uh, the Russian Federation. So that's why Mr. Abe didn't succeed. It may, he, he you know, it, it could be all right in 10 years or 20, but not in a foreseeable future. And that's how, how uh, we're, uh, that's where we are. And uh, probably we cannot repeat the same uh, same uh, policy as Mr. Uh, Abe uh, adopted vis a vis Russia in the next four, four or five years. I don't think so. Do you have any thoughts, Jim, on uh, on, on Russia vis a vis the U.S. Japan relation? Should we? Yeah, I think um, it's really instructive uh, to see how strong U.S. Japan relations were. Um, in looking at uh, Japanese and U.S. policies toward Russia, because during the um, Obama administration, um, this was a source of tension in U.S.-Japan relations. That Prime Minister Abe, for very good reasons, was trying to resolve the leftover issues from World War II by forging a personal relationship with Putin, and uh, he, his hope was that they could sign a peace treaty and resolve the territorial issues. Um, this occurred while Russia uh, took over Crimea and was making mischief in Ukraine. And so the United States was working with our European friends to impose costs on Russia. And uh, the Japanese, because they had their own policies, which were involved in Russia's Asia existence, um, were uh, less willing to come along with the United States. So we had behind the scenes, I can't recall how many times I visited the foreign ministry with the marshes complaining about Japan uh, participating in an industrial fair somewhere in Russia or these sorts of things at a time when we were imposing this. But the point I wanted to make here is despite these differences, that did not prevent the United States and Japan from collaborating and cooperating where our interests align, which were 95% of the cases. So uh, what that experience proved to me was we can surmount differences. And we are two sovereign nations. We have sometimes different interests. So certainly from the perspective of the United States, we don't expect Japan to blindly follow US wishes in every case. Uh, we certainly hope because of our interests align and because we have common values that in most cases we can work together. And I think we, we will. But unfortunately, in the case of Russia, um, Prime Minister Abe was trying very, very hard. And I agree with Kuni, he failed. Uh, and I think the fault really lies with the Russian failure to take advantage of a strategic opportunity. So perhaps in 20 years, Kuni, um, you will be able to resolve this issue in the Northern Territories, but, but I, I don't have any hopes. So I think in the short term, actually, our Russia policies will be pretty well aligned because the hope for a break breakthrough on the Japanese part is, is pretty dim right now. 
Now you, um, although your two diplomats are not technologists, I feel I, I bo- bo- I'm obliged to ask you about 5G, 6G, and open RAN, and I won't ask you to draw diagrams, but rather I will ask you <laughs> in the statement, the other thing that we haven't mentioned is in the statement, there's quite a strong commitment to working together and indeed talking of uh, billions of dollars of money on both sides. Um, how to interpret such things in an official statement? Um, is this something that actually the US Congress will provide the funds for um, and the Japanese budget? Is this real or is this a kind of a, a, a gesture about, uh, about uh, importance? I think this is a necessity for two reasons. One for the United States and one for, uh, for Japan. Um, I think uh, what we are witnessing is not the uh, of globalization of the world economy. Unfortunately, probably with the uh, uh, showdown between China and the United States, probably the global economy will be divided into two. Unfortunately, like in the 1930s, uh, there there was a a block economies, economic economic blocks at that time. I'm saying that no, there'll be no economic blocks in the 2020s, uh, but there could be uh, uh, digital economic blocks. So the digital world prevailed by China and another digital world uh, uh, centered around the United States and Europe. So I think this is going to happen. So in order for the United States, as Mr. Blinken and others claimed, in order for the United States to challenge uh, uh, and compete with China, the United States need to have a robust economy and they have to take care of the middle class workers and farmers and those people. And I, that's the uh, part of the uh, policy of Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Biden. So I think for two reasons, uh, this is not a, a, a gesture. This is a serious thing. And the problem, that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, one of the means and uh, 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 means for, for Japan to survive as an economy. Jim, how do you see this? Well, thank you very much. And you're right that there is um, a, a huge potential for the United States and Japan to work together in the area of technology. You know, just one anecdote, when I was at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo, Uh, the section of the embassy that had the most visitors was our very small National Science Foundation office. And they had every month hundreds of visitors coming. uh, These are American scientists uh, coming to Japan for collaboration and research with Japanese counterparts in areas ranging from nanotechnology to earthquake detection uh, to uh, human health and medicine a whole range of fields. So there is a very, very active collaborative relationship between American and Japanese uh, researchers. Um, I don't know the numbers, but you know, many of the Japanese Nobel Prize winners uh, were awarded Nobel Prizes for work they did uh, in American universities. Um, so, and that will continue, I'm sure. Uh, and I'm sure both governments will be funding this kind of uh, uh, academic collaboration, which has been so fruitful and so successful. Um, but getting, you asked the question of will Congress fund this and the uh, promises that the Biden, uh, that President Biden made in the joint statement um, are part of the infrastructure bill. It's a very massive uh, bill that's before Congress right now. Uh, that bill will certainly change, but I'm guessing that there is pretty broad bipartisan support in Congress for the United States government to fund activities that help us compete with China. So I'm guessing those parts of the bill will survive. Uh, at least I certainly hope so. I also wanted to make one more point if I might, uh, cause we haven't discussed this yet. And that is how I think the United States and Japan will continue to work together to deal with what I call Chinese sharp power. And what I mean by Chinese sharp power is China has been showing over the past decade, a willingness to try and punish uh, countries that do things that it doesn't like. So for example, when Canada um, uh, arrests a Chinese traveler who's wanted in the United States, China arrests two Canadians in China as hostages and has held them in jail for two years. Uh, H&M 
the Swedish company is now facing a, a, a consumer boycott because it's said it's refusing to use uh, cotton made in Xinjiang. Uh, Japan itself was a victim of this when China abruptly cut off uh, exports of rare metals years ago. So we, China will do this. Don't forget uh, Australia. And in Australia, right, exactly. If you're a wine producer in Australia, it's very tough right now because you've lost one of your biggest markets. Um, so it's important for all of us to work together to mitigate the impact of Chinese sharp power. It's the opposite of sanctions, if you will. Uh, we ought to be buying Australian wine right now in solidarity. Uh, but I think there's some, some reason, some room for us to talk together about how do we mitigate Chinese attempts uh, to punish countries for doing things that are upholding democratic values that we all support. And through that kind of solidarity, and I think that, uh, Kuni, I'd be interested in your thoughts, but I'm sure the Japanese side would be quite willing to try and work uh, to help our friends and allies who are facing Chinese economic pressure as a result of principled stands they're taking. Perhaps I might, I mean, yes. frame that for Kuni uh, with another question that Larry Stone has put in asking both of you what couple of areas might both countries prioritize for the G7 gathering in June in Cornwall that the UK is hosting? How do both of you see the D10, the 10 dem democracies idea? Is this part of that uh, phenomenon? I mean, the G7 is uh, a, a, an assembly of, of democratic countries, if you like, and in the anti-sharp power um, group. H how, would you, how would you answer that question? And put well, we used to have G8. It wasn't successful. No. And uh, it, it is fine to invite uh, some like-minded democracies to the uh, uh, venue of G7 summit and have a, a extended uh, discussion. But uh, I think G7 is still too big. And if you make it G10 or 12, it's, it will be more chaotic than productive, at least for, for the time being. So what, okay, within the, staying with the G7, what, um, and the fact that it's going to meet in Cornwall, uh, what would be your priorities? What should be at the top of the agenda, the top two things on the agenda, each of you, Cooney? Well, China is one. And probably uh, Japanese uh, domestic priority is North Korea, mm -hmm. but uh, probably not the global uh, priority. What about you, Jim? Um, I would say I'm uh, speaking, I don't want to speak for the Biden administration, but guessing what their two, if you had two priorities, it would be just abolished capital punishment. Um, the reason for that was the Democratic Party took over both houses of their uh, state assembly and there's a Democratic governor, so it was possible. But, I, but there is clearly a strong movement against capital punishment uh, and the, uh, but unfortunately, particularly in Southern states in the United States, it's still a strong view that capital punishment is a deterrent. So it's gonna continue to be a huge domestic issue in the United States. Um, and personally, I would welcome more pressure from our friends in Europe on this aspect, because it's not a, uh, it, it clearly is a, in my view, an embarrassment for the United States. Um, uh, the numbers, particularly the numbers of executions that we carry out every year, it's really uh, appalling. And so uh, I would urge our friends in Europe to support those in the United States that are working hard for abolition. Just as a well, lot. Likewise, likewise, uh, the anti death penalty discussion is growing in, in my country as well. But personally, I don't think we have reached a level to change or even propose a change to the system of uh, capital punishment in the foreseeable future in my country. Because I'm against it. <laughs> Well, thank you to both of you for answering questions on such a wide range of, of issues. It's been a fascinating uh, discussion, great questions as well. Sorry, I couldn't get to the last couple, but uh, um, there was a terrific tour of the world and of world issues, which just shows that the US, Japan, and indeed the UK are very, very much on the same page as far as the sort of issues that matter. I'm going to thank you, James Zumwalt in Washington, DC, and Kunihiko Miyake in Tokyo for sparing the time to be with us. Delighted to have this 
collaboration between cousins across the uh, across the Atlantic as well. Uh, and thank you to all Japan Society members for taking part and for supporting. Thank you, Bill, for having us. Thanks a lot to you both. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.